Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube. And this is part of the good stuff, too. This is going to go down the ebook series. And I am super happy to have ebook author Stephen Kane with us today. Hey, Stephen. Hi. How are you doing, Frank? I am doing wonderful on this July 1st of 2022 as we shoot this. And summer is in full swing in Phoenix. We're getting our rains, the monsoons are rolling in. It's the wet season in Phoenix. And where are you at, Stephen? Well, uh, I mean, it looks like I'm on the surface of Venus, but not too dissimilar. Uh, uh, I'm in Riverside, <laughs> where we, oh, have, we have definitely entered the raging hot part of our summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so, so that's where I, where I am. I'm at the University of California, Riverside right now. Uh, and, uh, and, and things are going really well. Great. Well, I hope the surface of Riverside or Venus, as it may be, kind of cools off here a little bit for the 4th of July. Um, Stefan, what do you like to do for, for research and or education? Well, uh, I've been studying exoplanets since 95, which is when I started grad school. And that's when the, the whole topic of exoplanets started Ooh. to expand rapidly. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've been very fortunate in that I, I came into that whole topic on the ground floor and um, uh, I've, over the years I've been using uh, different methods of finding uh, exoplanets. I started out using microlensing, uh, and, which is what my uh, graduate school thesis was on. But then uh, I started working on transits. I built a, an, an instrument called WASP, which is, became oh, yeah. SuperWASP. Uh, when I was at the University of St. Andrews and then when I was at University of Florida, I started working on radial velocities and then I was a research scientist for five years at uh, the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute and that's where I really combined a lot of these things together and started thinking about planetary habitability because uh, this was in the uh, mid 2000s when we were we were starting to find smaller and smaller planets. Before then, it was it was all really about gas giants. Uh, and so the whole issue of exoplanet people not really knowing anything about planets, which is a counterintuitive thing, by the way, I'll mention that. Um, exoplanetary scientists, by and large, is not planetary science because if you think about how it's progressed in the ways which we've found them, it's all stellar astrophysics mm -hmm. because uh, it's essentially eclipsing binary stars. The yeah. radial velocity method and transit method is inherited from eclipsing binary stars. And so in this method, we, we don't see the planet, but we observe what we can, which is the star, and try to infer the presence of an object yep. and hope that we can show that that object is not stellar. Uh, therefore, it's a planet. So that's the way in which the field progressed. But in the 2000s, especially in the year of Kepler, we started to find terrestrial planets. And so at that point, it became very clear to me that we needed to actually uh, intermingle with the planetary science community, the earth science community, the geophysics community, and really make this interdisciplinary. So that's when I really started focusing on, plan focusing on planetary habitability, which is been the overarching theme of my research ever since. Um, thinking about, uh, in particular, uh, Venus behind me, uh, the difference between Venus and Earth, how they ended up differently, and uh, all the factors, the various factors that affect planetary habitability, uh, which is undoubtedly what we're going to be talking about today. And that includes things like orbital dynamics, the, the changes of the star itself, uh, and the intrinsic properties of the planet itself, how it degasses over time. Uh, so that's that's uh, mostly uh, what takes up the vast majority of my of my time. I would say. Cool. Um, so, what gave you the idea to do any book? Um, well, so to be honest with you, I wasn't thinking about writing a book at all, and I, <laughs> I had been asked on numerous occasions to to write a book and I'd always resisted those calls and I had contributed uh, to, uh, to other eBooks like written chapters. There was, there was many book uh, eBooks which are compilations. And so uh, I'd written chapters for, uh, for other books such as one about the Kepler mission which was led by, yes. mm -hmm. by Steve Howe. Mm -hmm. And um, so in 2017, 
uh, the the ebooks e uh, folks reached out to me Ooh. and asked if I'd be interested in writing a uh, a book on planetary habitability. Uh, and uh, at the end of that year, I went to a Habitable Worlds meeting, which was held in Laramie, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, I had kind of said, no, I don't want to do this uh, to, to the request. But then I spoke to some colleagues who, who kind of, uh, I was going to say they pressured me to do it. That sounds meaner than I intended. Uh, but, but I will say that they convinced me there we go. that that it, it would be a, a good idea. It would be a useful thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that point, I, res I, I responded and said, yeah, this, uh, okay. Um, and part of the reason, and I speak a little bit about this in the preface of the book, part of the reason I was very resistant uh, is because this is a very interdisciplinary field as I spoke about, and it's also a rapidly changing field. And so part of my resistance was why would I write a book which is going to be uh, almost immediately outdated as soon as it's published, which I'm sure is a concern for many people who are, are writing similar kinds of kinds of books. But um, it turns out that uh, here at the University of California, Riverside, I do teach a graduate class called Planetary Habitability. And at this point, I taught it several times. And I have people in that class because because I'm uh, in an uh, an Earth and Planetary Sciences department, and so that means that mm -hmm. the students who are in my class are very diverse. I have people from astronomy backgrounds, also geophysics and even biology, who are taking my class. And so uh, I I realized that it might be a good idea to take all the information that I've been conveying in a very interdisciplinary sense to these students and really put that together. Uh, in a, in a formal way, and so that was that was my motivation. Nice. In the end, about doing this. And so, how long did it take from once you uh, became convinced that you should do this um, and started sort of you know writing in earnest um, to to when it was published? Was this two weeks, three weeks? Well, this is where it becomes a little embarrassing because um, uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, writing a book. Uh, and and this is this had certainly been my prior experience when contributing chapters to other books. Uh, I had interacted with the ed the editors of those books who have an incredible cat herding challenge ahead of them, trying to get various authors to come through on their promise of yeah. writing a chapter and delivering it. It's very very difficult, and part of the challenge for that is that um that that uh, writing for a book seems to somehow fall to lesser priorities than other more immediate concerns maybe they're writing a paper maybe they have a class they have to prepare there's always something right and so if there's nobody uh, uh really uh they're pressuring you all the time, then it, it, it can be difficult. And so I knew already knew that this this was this was an issue. In this case, it was just me. That there wasn't going to be somebody sending me email saying, you know, where the hell is the chapter that you promised? It was just my own self-motivation. And I have many, many things going on. I have a fairly large research group and you know, um, uh, one month turned to the next month, one year turned to the next year. And, and part of my own internal justification of this uh, was that, as I mentioned earlier, this is a very rapidly changing field. And uh, in early 2018, the, the test mission, the Transient Exoplanet mm -hmm. Survey Satellite launched. That was in about April of 2018. And I went to the launch and I'm part of that mission and it's great. But nice. Since the purpose of the test mission was to detect planets around bright host stars that would make great JWST targets, yes. uh, I thought maybe I should be waiting to see uh, what the early results of the test mission are. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but, but I realized that this was just me justifying, you know, letting this uh, fall, fall down. And so <laughs> it actually kind of took the pandemic to really <laughs> <laughs> which is, mm -hmm. is terrible mm -hmm. but uh, but uh, since uh, 
uh, uh, we, we were stuck at home. I had no shortage of things to do, but me being stuck at home actually uh, forced me to be self-reflective about this book, what I wanted it to achieve, how soon I wanted it to get out and now being the time to do it, uh, that it, it really uh, helped me get this, the self-motivation to actually do it. So uh, I, I, I really started writing it in force during the summer of 2020. Okay. Um, and prior to that, I'd put together ideas just into this document, like here's the skeleton and ideas and things, but I started actually putting words into these things in 2020. And then the, the last summer of uh, 2021 is when I managed to get on the home stretch and really drive it to completion. So the cool. draft, the final version of the draft was submitted uh, uh, to, uh, to IOP uh, in about September uh, of last year. And uh, in the meantime, I was thankful to have numerous colleagues who looked at it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I didn't want this to uh, not have another set of eyes look at it and make sure. And they gave me a lot of feedback, which was great. Uh, so I felt pretty confident in the end result. Uh, and then um, it finally saw the proofs, I guess it was like November or December of last year. They were, they were quite good in turning that around. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty quick turnaround. Very good. Yeah, so that uh, so um, for those watching at home who want to write an ebook, that's sort of um, there's some tales there on on writing one. And yes, it's not a two or three week process. Typically, they're more like a two year, three year process. Is kind of what we hear repeatedly on these ebooks. Um, just you know, when you get serious about writing a book, it takes time. And and one thing I will say about being a single author book is that it helped me. Uh, write it in a self-consistent style yeah. and also in a way that the chapters connected with each other. Um, it's, it's, it's something that I've noticed with uh, other books that are a compilation of authors. Some do it really well mm -hmm. and have uh, kind of firewalls between the, between the chapters and uh, others don't and to various levels of success. And um, sometimes it can be a bit of whiplash from going from one chapter to the next in those kinds of books. And I wanted to get away from that and really make sure that there was a story arc to the book from beginning to end nice. uh, that, that really held it all together more cohesively. Cool. Um, you mentioned that you uh, teach a uh, habitability graduate student course. Um, so is that the target audience for the ebook or are we does it go undergraduate individ, um, uh, independent research? What were sort of the target audience or what was your thoughts on when you were writing this? Yeah, so um, uh, another part of my resistance to writing a book in the first place was uh, aren't there already books on this on this subject? And uh, when I looked at those books and I have some of those uh, uh, bookshelf uh, books on, on the bookshelf in, in front of me, uh, and there are a couple of uh, very good books on planetary climates and the evolution of terrestrial planets, but these are written at quite a, an advanced level. Okay. And so, uh, like I said, I have a very uh, interdisciplinary group of students who come into my class. And so I decided to target this for, uh, for uh, early career people or just anybody from any discipline who wants to get a big picture idea of what are the processes that are affecting planetary habitability. It is such a vast topic that part of the challenge in coming into it is knowing even where to start or how everything connects to everything else. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I really wanted to uh, drive home uh, in, in the message of this book uh, for people who are coming into it. Plus it is a very useful uh, reference for anybody who's deeply engrossed in the field as well uh, to see how all the pieces connect together. And so uh, it's the, the target audience is pretty broad, uh, I would say. But I, when I wrote it, I was mostly thinking about these, the graduate students in my class about what they would appreciate the most. Cool, cool. And with that, let's go ahead and get into this very awesome ebook on planetary habitability and Stefan, Take it away. We'll start maybe with this fascinating. Oh, right. Yes. Well, so one of the interesting parts when you get to the end game of writing the book 
the uh, IOP start to talk to you about, so what, what are you interested in using as your cover art? And they do have a whole bunch of standard template sort of pictures. Uh, and so they've got a bunch of exoplanets, you know, to the kind of the usual artist depiction of a planet in the foreground and a star in the background, something like that. But I, I really wanted to add the axis of time because that's something which is an important theme in my book, which is it's not enough to just look at planets at the present epoch. It's, it's important to consider how they started, how they're going to end, and all the stages in between. And one of the, the best, uh, if not the best currently archetype we have of that is Earth. Uh, and so how has the Earth changed through time? And so I did a Google image search and I found this picture, which is a depiction of Earth through time. So it starts with the top uh, left, uh, which is Earth's past when the, there was relatively few continents and it depicts transitions through snowball states. There's all been all kinds of uh, processes that the Earth has gone through. The bottom, uh, uh, bottom left is obviously the present uh, Earth, but then it goes further forward as the luminosity of the sun increases and then ends with the bottom right. And I loved this picture and I loved that depiction yes. of Earth through time. And I discovered that the person who produced uh, this picture was none other than Don Brownlee, who is uh, at University of Washington and uh, publisher of, of the famous book, Rare Earth. Yes. So I reached out to Don and, and, uh, and uh, I, I went kind of fanboy on him and said, oh, you know, I'm a huge oh, fan of his work. And, I, yeah, yeah. and I, I'm writing this book, <laughs> I'm publishing this book. I would love to use your picture for the cover art. And he wrote back to me very enthusiastically um and said uh yes that that would be wonderful uh in fact let me send you an updated version he he wanted to update the graphics a little bit so he did and uh, so he sent me that picture but i had never met don unfortunately but at the uh at the AAS meeting which we just held in pasadena mm -hmm. uh, i i went to one of the town halls so it was the one for noir lab uh which was held in the evening and i was at that uh, at this town hall for Noir Lab, and I looked across the room and I saw this old guy, and uh, I saw his name badge, Don Brownlee. And so I thought, oh my God, I've got to meet Don. And so I went over uh, and introduced myself. I wasn't wearing my name badge at, at, at the at the time because of the evening, but I said, oh, I'm Stephen. I'm the person who reached out to you. It's like, oh yeah, okay. And then we had uh, he has he has some really really interesting ideas about what's going to happen to the earth in the future. But anyway, that's the story of the, of, of the cover art. It worked out really amazingly well. And I'm so glad that Don agreed to let me use it. Very cool. Next time you run into him, you can get him to sign a copy of your book. <laughs> well, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to send him a copy and uh, okay. I need to send him an extra copy so he can sign it and send it back to me. <laughs> Very good. And let's see. Do, 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 See, there it is, cover image, courtesy of Don Brownlee. There it is, yep. yep. Very good, very cool. And we roll into the table of contents. Right, yeah. Um, so uh, the first couple of chapters were the uh, were very interesting chapters to write because mm -hmm. that's where I'm defining what habitability is. And I'll tell you that Another reason, apart from the whole field changing so rapidly, another reason that I was reluctant to write this book, uh, well, it was actually a double-edged sword. I'll, I'll explain what, what I mean by that in a moment, it is that the topic of planetary habitability is quite controversial. I would say it's one of the most controversial topics within astronomy sure. at the moment and has been for a while. Yep. Um, and uh, a large part of that controversy, I believe, has originated from numerous uh, hyperbolic press releases that that, ha that have occurred from uh, yes. from, ex from exoplanet people who, as I said, actually don't uh, usually don't know much about planets. But but then there's been press releases saying, oh, this this planet is habitable, and there have been even very strong claims about life being on these planets or yes. the or the percentage chance sometimes to several significant figures as to whether the planet has life on it. And that, that kind of unfortunate discussion has caused 
uh, people within the field to say, well, the whole topic of planetary habitability is just a whole bunch of grandstanding nonsense. Right. And so the common question that comes up is, well, what even is planetary habitability? What do we mean by that? And so the reason I said that it was a double-edged sword in whether I wanted to do this or not, because on the one hand, I was, of course, reluctant to confront this controversy. But on, on the other hand, I felt that this desperately needed clarification. And so it actually motivated me as well to to address this and so that's what the first couple of chapters are about defining what is planetary habitability and right. one thing i made very clear in there is that this is not about life and that's something i want to state up front that this is not a book about biosignatures yes it's not even a book about life which which sounds almost uh, contradictory it's this book is about the conditions or the factors that control the surface conditions of a planet uh, and allow it to maintain uh, temperate conditions uh, in, in this case. Uh, because as I said, I'm in an earth and planetary sciences department. And the interesting thing that my earth science colleagues have said to me is that one of the most amazing things about earth is that it has had surface liquid water for almost all of its history, which, which if you don't think about it, you kind of shrug your shoulders and you say, so what? But that means that it has had a very narrow temperature range mm -hmm. for almost all for more than four billion years which when you think about it is is extraordinary really? and so what this book is about is and this is how i'm defining planetary habitability as uh the ability of a planet to maintain temperate surface conditions regardless of whether life evolves or, or anything like that that is something else um, that that, that can follow from it, but the primary concern I had is about um, all of those factors. And so that, that's what those first couple of chapters are about. But then after that, going into chapter three, because in chapter two, I, I briefly outlined what, what the factors are. And then the subsequent chapters after chapter two are focusing on each of the factors that I mentioned in chapter two. And I start with the star. That's the fundamental place that I always start when I'm talking to my graduate students about it, because a big part of uh, planetary habitability is the energy balance. What is controlling the energy balance at the surface? And usually the overwhelming factor is the flux from the star at the top of the atmosphere that is controlling the energy balance of an atmosphere. And so I wanted to start there first and talk about the effect of the star. Um, and as the star evolves, how does that change? After that, then I go into the, the, the intrinsic properties of the planet itself. Uh, and I roughly kind of divide it into the atmosphere and the interior after talking about what we mean by the energy balance and how we, how we quantify that. Mm -hmm. But then talking about, as I mentioned earlier, a big concern for me is the axis of time. We always need to focus on the, on the axis of time. It's something that I'm very con uh, concerned about in my own work and in the future work. So for example, when we are, measuring the atmospheres of exoplanets that are uh, with, with JWST uh -huh. uh, or other facilities. And maybe we determined that the planet is in a post-runaway greenhouse state like Venus. Maybe we determined that it doesn't have an atmosphere at all because it's being re removed mostly through um, uh, erosion from the effect of the host star. Maybe we, we determined that it's a planet that has managed to maintain temperate surface conditions. But all of that uh, is, of course, very interesting. But unless we're able to calibrate those stages of planetary evolution on an axis of time, then it there's, there's actually quite limited information that that provides to us. Because if we look at a whole bunch of planets and they're all in post-runaway greenhouse states like Venus, well, but we ignore the fact that maybe all of those planets are eight, 8 billion years old, then maybe all that we're saying is that all, all planets turn into Venus eventually, we know, which doesn't really, that doesn't really help us a lot unless we understand where they are in that evolution. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's why I was, um, spoke about um, planetary evolution a lot. And then, of course, I, I can't ignore the, the, the issue of water worlds. I, I, I talk a lot about uh, that, and as you may know, Frank, I've worked with my colleagues at, uh, at Arizona State, Steve Desch and others uh, a lot in thinking about water worlds and what, 
because and and the reason it's important to mention that is because NASA has an often cited mantra of follow the water, the water. Um, like this connection to surface liquid water and uh, you could naively think that if water is good for habitability then that means if a little bit of water is good then a lot of water must be great like that there's somehow some proportionality but it's actually not true it doesn't work that way and you can have too much of a good thing when it comes Absolutely. to surface liquid water so that's what i talk about there um so uh in in chapter five uh that's where i talk about one of the other factors which is uh the orbital dynamics uh this is uh, somewhat of a biased approach because this is a big part of my own research is which is that I, I love orbital dynamics I've, uh, I've always been very interested in it it's a big part of my work now but it's it's important topic to address here because that's another thing that affects the energy balance especially if planets are uh, a, a, their orbits have been perturbed and they're in eccentric orbits which means you have a variable incident flux at the top of the atmosphere that's important to take into account. And so there's all kinds of things like how does the effect, uh, the rotation rate of the planet affect uh, uh, the, the, the climate of the planet, how do moons affect it and so on. So um, then the, the next chapter, I dive into uh, the habitable zone and you'll notice that I start <laughs> by saying that it's a controversial topic and this goes back to what I said earlier, yeah. because, because part of the reason yeah. that hyperbolic press releases were made during the, the 2000s and the 2010s is because, as I mentioned earlier, that was a period during which the exoplanet field started to find planets which you could consider terrestrial. Mm -hmm. And at that point, interest in the habitable zone, which, had, which has been a topic that's existed in the literature for many decades, and most particularly Jim Casting's paper of 1993 yes. uh, really quantified uh, this in a climate model perspective, which hadn't been rigorously done before. And so a lot of people were pointing back to Jim's paper and then putting their paper in the Hubble zone and then kind of putting one and one together and calculating an answer like five, you know? So that they, it, 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 was, it was a very frustrating time uh, and I think that's what that's what led to misuse of the Hubble zone. And so I spent some time at the beginning of that chapter. What does the Hubble zone mean? Because the Hubble zone implies the zone in which things are habitable, but that's not actually what it means. All it, uh, the Hubble zone is is a target selection tool from which we could prioritize okay. the the assessment of targets, which are because. As we know, there are many, many targets we'd love to look at with James Webb. We won't have time for all of them. And so we're going to need to make tough decisions. And that's what the Hubble Zone is for, helping us to prioritize because it's a very anthropic Earth-based approach. Yes. The calculations of the Hubble Zone literally take the Earth and change the, the, uh, both the, the amount of insulation flux, but the SED, the, 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 the spectral energy distribution. So whether you have more infrared or more ultraviolet, line how does that affect the energy balance right. specifically for the earth mm -hmm. uh and so it's something that that we need to take into, into, into account i do spend some time at the end of that chapter suge suggesting what i think the most interesting <laughs> targets are based on the Hubble zone. okay so the next chapter is very near and dear to my heart because i spend equal times on exoplanets and planetary science these days yes. and so i think it's extremely important to consider the lessons learned from the solar system because a sobering thought that we always have to address is that we are not going to have in situ data for an exoplanet i mean for the most part we can't even see them right the, the transit and radial velocity method these are indirect methods right. and but we're certainly not going to have in situ data we're not landing anything on the surface of proxima centauri b which is by no. definition the nearest exoplanet no. we're not sending an orbiter to toi 700 d or anything like that no. none of that no. No. So this, <laughs> yeah so this is an important thing because it means that how then do we approach this topic of habitability of exoplanets? And the answer is, is that we use a model-based approach which infers the surface condition based on what little we know about them. And those models uh, come directly from in-situ data from our solar system. Yes. So the solar system is 
the foundation for everything that we're going to learn about our exoplanets. And so I, I really put a lot of effort into thinking about this chapter and what are the lessons that uh, everything teaches us. I mean, we, we just tend to think about the Earth, but even the Moon and Mercury teach us a lot because of the impact craters, for example, and yeah. how that, that has mm -hmm. shaped things. And, and Jupiter, um, about how Jupiter has, uh, has really, it's by far the dominant planetary mass in the solar system, and so it has played an enormous role in shaping the architecture yes. of our, our solar system. So there's a lot of important things there. Um, and so then, of course, I talk about exoplanets and um, what we know and what we don't know. And you notice I've got a subsection there called data limitations. And that's mm -hmm. where I have a dose of reality about uh, here, is, here is the limitations. Here is what we can measure, things like mass and radius. If we're fortunate to have a transiting terrestrial planet around a bright host star, yeah. that alone makes it a fairly rare occurrence. But what are the things that we don't know? And the answer is there are many, many. Lots of things. <laughs> so it's, it's important to be realistic about, about this. But as, I, uh, as is implied by the title of the first subsection, the real value of exoplanets is it provides a statistical context in which we can place planetary habitability. And so we can start to look things in like bulk distributions. So I finish up with what the next steps are and that's where I talk uh, talk a lot about what the what the future uh, plans are from both the exoplanet side and the planetary science side how these will uh, merge together and I end with uh, the um, uh, the subsection called unlocking achievements and that's where I talk about what are the important planetary or system properties uh, that we need to know about that I've spoken about in previous chapters that okay. how could we feasibly get there what is the pathway for it? So anyway, that's a, 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 a summary of the whole book. Very awesome. Very awesome. Um, and you kind of touch on it a little bit here in nine. And so I'm going to I'm going to um, push on that a little bit in several regards <clears throat> um, going toward the future. Uh, so you did get you did uh, get your original wish was was to have JWST come up by the time the book came out. And that happened. <laughs> yeah, so that was very good. Um, but are there are there other uh, specific uh, or leveraging uh, missions that could be used to enhance to get a bigger statistical sample? So, for example, there was Kepler, there was TESS, Plato is coming. Are there other you know near future missions, perhaps in other wavelengths uh, that that could be useful um, going forward? And once you sort of get that, I'll work in my second second question. So will there be a planet habitability, habitability two book in two years, five years, 10 years? Right, yeah. So in terms of what's coming up, uh, of, of course, we've got some things which are which are right in front of us. And that is uh, James Webb uh, starting to build up a statistical um, an analysis of the absorption features that are present in planetary atmospheres is going to be extremely important. Yes. Uh, the Trappist system is going to be very, very important for this. Uh, one of the limitations there is that uh, the the instrumentation on on web are primarily in the infrared. Yes. And so uh, the that limits the absorption features for 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 uh, some of the species, which would help us to diagnose ambiguity in in biosignatures uh, mm -hmm. or whether. A, a, uh, a planet is more, say, more Venus-like or Earth-like. And what I mean by that, for example, is that there are several carbon dioxide absorption features uh, that are within the uh, James Webb uh, band pass. Mm -hmm. But if you look at uh, the transmission spectrum for Earth and Venus, they actually look pretty similar because uh, the absorption, the carbon dioxide absorption at the top of the atmosphere is actually a little bit stronger for Earth. So how do you diagnose that? Um, and there are several ways you can do that. And one is to go into the ultraviolet and look for things like ozone, mm -hmm. uh, which Earth has, but Venus does not. So, uh, so going into the future, it'll be important to uh, expand our passband range. For, okay. And that was uh, one of the purposes for proposed missions like Louvois, where the UV oh, yeah. stands okay. for ultraviolet. Right. Uh, 
And um, I, I think NASA headquarters is now calling it I, IRUV, which is the merged mission, which came out of the Astro 2020 decadal. Okay. So they're, they're just, um, you know, highlighting the infrared band pass there, infrared ultraviolet, you know? So it's, it's great that they're emphasizing that. I just hope we don't continue to use that name, but <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very uninspiring. Um, but, uh, but that's, I, I think the, uh, exoplanet field needs to move more in the direction of uh, of of uh, direct imaging which is fortunately what was emphasized out of, the, out of 2020 in the near term we have roman which is somewhat of a technology demonstration but it will be able to detect giant planets and i think that's going to be important going forward as we get towards direct imaging of our nearest neighbors i think that's really important that we start to move to characterization of planets for the nearest stars which is something that frankly the transit method cannot really do or at least it's not optimized for that because transit method is a statistical method um somewhat like microlensing except repeatable you know there you go there you um, go <laughs> so uh so I'd, I'd love that to move into direct imaging but for, for planetary science and this is something i talk about in the final chapter of the book it's important to see those as two sides of the same coin because we've got a lot of great missions uh coming up such as europa clipper which is going to be telling oh, yes. us a lot about uh um, subsurface oceans mm -hmm. uh and dragonfly which is going to be extremely important for uh for assessing i mean having a moon like titan that has a one and a half bar atmosphere is really incredible and i i think that's something that we need to know a lot about um and uh of course and going back to what's behind me here, I'm uh, part of the uh, da, the Da Vinci mission, the, oh, cool. that's just one of three yeah. missions, Da Vinci, Veritas, and Envision, we're going back to Venus. And I think that Venus is uh, what I refer to as an anchor point for planetary habitability, understanding how two Earth-sized planets can go in completely different directions is uh, absolutely critical to um, diagnosing the whole topic of of planetary habitability and, um, and that loops back a little bit to the point you made earlier that that our solar system is the one we're going to be exploring and how we can leverage that into other ones um we need to know what's going on on our own <laughs> yeah 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 exactly this is where all the data is coming from for right. for our, our, our model. Long time. um but like i said that there's a lot of there's a lot of cool stuff which is coming uh and as i mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation i was i was uh, hesitant about writing the book because I knew things were, were moving rapidly, but I knew that I eventually it was decided and convinced by colleagues that now is the right time to do it. However, when I, as soon as I finished writing the book, I, uh, I, I thought I could have done that better. <laughs> well, I, I could have, I could have included more details. And uh, in fact, I've, I've already spoken to the IOP folks about how, I mean, of course, it's not something I'm going to be working on right away, but I, I'm already thinking maybe in about five years time yeah. or, you know, that kind of time scale, yeah. it might be a good time to update it, expand it, expand uh -huh. a lot of the explanations. Uh, I really kind of skimmed the surface on a lot of different topics out of necessity because it's such a big field, but uh, I, I would like to expand on it cool. uh, in, in the future. Presumably, uh, version two in five years will go a little bit quicker because you got the the base down now. Um, so good, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think that next time around, I'll, I've already got the foundation of what I want to say. I just want to do that plus X, you know, and add good. a bit more to that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well, keep it because you know it's a very rapidly evolving field. Um, yeah. And so in five years, seems like a good time scale to you know update the current state of uh, where we are and where we're headed. Yeah, I think uh, so. Five years. Uh, you, you think about um, uh, where we're going to be with uh, with five years of of James Webb uh, mm -hmm. data behind us. The lessons that we'll have learned then, uh, and at that point, also five years. Um, uh, Roman hopefully uh, will have been launched, uh, yep. and we'll have first data from Roman. Uh, the uh, European Plato mission. Yes. Uh, will have uh, will have found new opportunities for us and we'll be getting ready to drop um probes into the atmosphere of of venus so you know depending on how i how 
I feel about the way things are going then because things are changing so rapidly, then I may decide, you know, maybe I should wait until after we drop that probe and find out what we learn uh, and, you know, push it back another year or two. But but five years sounds, ballpark sounds about the right time for me. Cool. Very cool. Stefan, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely and new ebook uh, on Hab Planet Hand Habitability. Well, thank you very much. It's been great talking about it. And thanks for inviting me to come and chat. Yeah, you're welcome. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better, everyone. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.